Hello, and welcome to the Empowered Whistleblower Radio Show. I am your talk host, Dawn Westmoreland, coming from Asheville, North Carolina, the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. I am your talk host with WPVM LP FM 103.7. Each Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Zone, or whatever time you listen or stream in, you can hear my show. My show is about workplace issues, and I believe that everyone deserves to work in a safe and respectful work environment. Today, I am talking to Felix Nater, and I have had him on the show before. He hails from, you're in Concord, North Carolina, correct, Felix? Correct, Donna. Because I know you've moved on us one time. Yes, I've been all over the place. I am so excited because I've told a lot of my friends and listeners that I would be talking to, researching and interviewing Felix Nader, who's one of the leading workplace violence prevention consultants. Felix, let's kick it in. And it just seems like there's a lot more violence in the world, violence in the workplace. Let's take it from there. What's going on? It's a phenomenon, Donna. And first of all, thank you very much for having me back on your show. I I enjoy you particularly because you know how to ask tough questions, and they may they may seem innocuous, but to me they put me on the on the hot seat because uh, I don't know all the answers. And I come to you as a consultant advisor who understands the issues uh, from a collaborative point of view. I don't pr- profess to know it all, and, and my success comes from working within organizations who are willing to share their own resources. Um, We have to look back at the last uh, 14, 15 months to see why we're here. And it may have been just a a waiting period for an explosion. I call it the maximum expansion of the rubber band when you 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 pull, 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 and it pops. Mm -hmm. Well, how long can you keep people sequestered, sheltered at home, away from their family members, uh, away from their social, social support systems, uh, before they start realizing that they, there are issues that they can't cope with alone. And, and we're all human beings, uh, Dawn, um, whether you're a leader, a supervisor, leader, manager, um, a worker, leader, um, we have issues at home that we bring to our workplaces. And if the leaders that want to be called leaders aren't uh, empathetic and sensitive to the workforce and understanding who they are, you, you have these maximum expansions of the rubber band and they pop. Does it make it right? Is, is the person a criminal? Yes, they become a criminal because they, they take the law into their own hands. But when they pop, we missed the warning signs. We missed the signals. So we need to be reconnected with our workforce sincerely and not in the way that we were operating pre-COVID, but moving forward in a new COVID environment. How do we deal with our workforce? How do we deal with our people? How do we deal with our families and with ourselves? You know, I know from working in the field of HR for over 30 years, and I've been a consultant for eight years, that a lot of times company leaders will wait to the last minute after something horrible, traumatic has happened. Why do they do that? Why are they not more proactive, Felix? You know, it's a a great question, Dawn. So I come from a background called the United States Postal Service. August 20th, 1986 uh, was our own infamy when uh, at Edmonton Post Office, a letter carrier by the name of Patrick Sherrill um, wrecked havoc on the Postal Service. And we were a public entity. We couldn't hide our mess. So we decided to be very upfront with it. And we reached out to the government. We reached out to Congress. We reached out to the Health Human Resource Secretary, everybody that could help. We, you know, we invited them to help us. The chief inspector formed the postal violence and addiction teams around the country and 39 divisions were proactively involved. I will submit to you that I took that success factor and brought it into my corporate consulting practice. And I will say to you categorically, nobody in the corporate sector takes workplace violence seriously. It's a reactionary response to something that happens because the investments in the preventive measures that are necessary that would help build an employee involvement are non-existent. There's a zero tolerance that's essential, but it is mismanaged in, mismanaged in how it adjudicates the incident and not the identification of the contributing factors. So there's no trust, there's no confidence, and the workforce doesn't believe in zero tolerance because they know when they drop a dime on Dawn, Dawn's gonna get disciplined. 
Dawn's not going to get help because she's having a matrimonial problem. Dawn's not going to get help because she's lacking in sufficient income to, to meet her family bills or not getting enough overtime. And her hair, she's pulling her hair out and that rubber band is popping. So we have a lack of intervention. We have a lack of investment. We have a lack of management commitment. And one more point to that, uh, Dawn, it's not me speaking, it's OSHA. The five principles begin with management commitment. I added on management investment. But management commitment talks about what we need to do from the top down. And they look at the investment portion of it as a financial commitment they're not willing to make. And so they discipline, discipline, discipline. They walk them out the door. So you got an unhappy person who walks out the door. 18 to 24 months later, his support system runs out. And who does he think of? that mean old dastardly supervisor and HR manager who forced me out the door without listening to my issues. That's what happens. So is it fair to say that the everyday person, you know, the everyday Joe, Mary Sue, that's working, they have a bad experience in the work, they, maybe they've gotten fired for problems in the work and now all of a sudden they've snapped and become a killer? They don't necessarily snap that morning. It's accumulation of the expansion of that rubber band. And, and let me illustrate how it happens. I report something that falls on deaf ears. Nobody paid attention, attention to me. I become a little bit disgruntled. I fester. I report something again, they label me the troublemaker because I'm not minding my own business. I don't know how to cope and I have limited coping skills. So now I take it above them and they label me uh, someone that needs to be disciplined because I fail to follow instructions and in how to handle complaints. And so I get disciplined. Nobody hears the, the, my original complaint. They're picking on me. Every time I go to my refrigerator to get my lunch, it's not where I put it. Or when I go to my toolkit to unlock my toolkit, there's somebody else's lock on it. Or when I go to my car to go home in the afternoon because they don't like me, my tires are punctured. Or when I try to, to get my supplies out of the supply room, the, the combination has been changed. They perpetually harass me. Why? I don't know. But nobody's listening to me. Okay, Nada, you fail to understand that we work in an environment where we have to get along. So I'm going to give you a letter of warning. Why are you giving me a letter of warning? Because you don't follow instructions and you're not a team player. The rubber band expands. Now I become totally disgruntled. I don't follow supervisory instructions. I become argumentative, confrontational. They cite me and they cite me and they cite me. They bring me into the office with the shop steward if I'm a union representative or independently with, with whom a person of my choice. And then they issue me separation documents. Right? So I don't understand what's going on here. I go home and I explain to my wife, I've just been fired. Then all the promises about COBRA, about severance packages, about the things that, and the benefits they're supposed to give me don't materialize. And I have no with what would all to pay my family bills that I'm stealing from my savings account to meet ends meet. My car is repossessed. My college tuition falls, falls flat, I can't meet it. My wife is angry at me. She tells me to get a job. I go to get a job and the bad paper follows me for my last employment. I am angry, pop. Then you begin those five stages that um, we call the five phases of the active shooter when you start thinking about it, you start mm -hmm. planning for it, you start doing the things that get you to that point. It's usually a considerable amount of time that that individual decides to go through this cycle. It isn't overnight like it's portrayed by the media or like it's portrayed by the workers. But if you ask the coworkers, they will say, Felix gave us enough warning signs, but nobody was paying attention. Mm -mm -mm. You know, Felix, I just had um, a talk with a company about an exit plan, you know, for somebody that's not working out in the company and the question was, what is a fair exit bonus or benefits? You know, do I just let them go or do I offer them, you know, benefits and such? And, you know, what I say is whatever that person was contracted or hired for, you know, make sure you're delivering so that we don't cause problems, exasperate the incivility in the uh, workplace and which ripples out to the world. And, and always do the right thing. And even though it didn't work out with the individual, be fair to them I, because they are a human being with that's human correct. being needs. 
One in seven employees, according to Sherm, the voice of everything that relates to work, feel unsafe at work. If they have that feeling, you know, going into a relationship with a supervisor, they are not confident, not confident, they don't trust, and they don't believe anything that management is, is, is uh, offering as a solution. So if they can live up to an employee's desire to move on and give them a decent separation consistent with management's, you know, uh, uh, policies and procedures, that's all well and good, but don't renege on it. You, you know, don't renege, don't promise, and then suddenly renege and decide that, well, Felix is gone and we can do this and we can do that, because that's when you have that, that emotional contagion that's brewing within me that's rationalizing and that's justifying the action I need to take. The workforce already knows that they're not treated fairly. And so all you're doing is dumping on them even more when you promise them something. And oh, by the way, the ones that are behind are witnessing what's transpiring. They are part of what they're being told not to do. And they're victimizing this individual and they're causing him or her to think not so nice thoughts about what they intend to do. And it doesn't start in the workplace. It starts at home. Ask the wives, ask the children of these victimized individuals um, how they treat family members when they're going through this horrific point in their lives. So the organization yeah. needs to start from the beginning by developing a credible approach to dealing with the human beings called adults in the workplace setting. They're, they're not robots. They're individuals that need to be treated with dignity and respect and need to be heard. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Felix, I've interviewed and talked to quite a few mental health professionals who say during COVID that there's an increase in substance abuse and an increase in mental health issues. I'm sure there's lots of people out there feeling depressed, feeling anxious, you know, maybe they're having PTSD because it reminds them of times when they had hard times in the past. All of this, does that influence workplace violence? It certainly does. It, it takes that innocent individual that is perplexed in how to resolve an issue, an issue personally, who doesn't know where to go to. They internalize this. And when management looks upon this person who is preoccupied in themselves, they don't go to ask, can I help? They go to get that person to do what they're, do, what they're supposed to be doing without asking what's bothering that individual. Now they have a, you know, a target on their chest, malingerer, shirker, never does his or her job. But meanwhile, the, th the true problem is between his or her, her ears. They're trying to cope with issues. They're on the phone a lot talking to their family members. They're on the phone a lot talking to their priests, their ministers, or their doctors. But no one seems to want to ask, how can we help? It's all a show. It's a show that one in seven employees say doesn't pass the muster test of credibility. I don't feel comfortable. And workplace suicides are high. You know, we're not paying attention to this. Another factor of the workplace violence phenomenon, because even though it's my life that I may take, all of my loved coworkers who see this are all affected by it traumatically. So it isn't just a physical impact, it's the psychological and the emotional impact that workplace violence has uh, on people. Yes, yes. So what is the first step that an employer should take so that their employees feel safe in their workplace? Serious-minded employers, and I know CEOs probably get more gray hair than what I have worrying about their next event, uh, need to own this from the top down. They need to bring their, their key staff in and say, you know, I'm tired of hearing this guy, Nader, talking about how we're not doing things properly. What do we need to do? The first thing they need to do is assess and evaluate their workplace environments. And I don't mean from a cookie cutter uh, mm -hmm. approach where they take somebody's uh, uh, a policy and then they roll it out as theirs. Really identify your unique aspects of what you do. Ask employees to a survey, 10 question survey, you know, answer these questions for us. Integrate the responses to that and then begin an approach based upon your understanding, your intimate understanding of what risk your employees are exposed to inside the workplace and outside the workplace, and then begin to develop an, a, a policy that's comprehensive enough, not complicated, Dawn, but comprehensive enough to deal with the OSHA four categories of violence, you know, employee on employee, former employee, the vendor customers and clients, the patients in the healthcare environment, and the 
and the intimate partner uh, domestic violence threat, as well as the outside threat by the opportunistic criminal. You understand what kind of a workplace you have. The workforce begins to say they care. They've asked me questions that are germane and relative to my personal safety and concerns. I am going to be honest and respond. That is the first step. From the top down, inculcate a position of interest in the hearts and minds of the workforce so that they believe in you and they trust in you and they want to support your efforts. I like that. Trust and engagement. Absolutely. Now, let's take another um, perspective. Let's say sure. I know that most of the active shooters have been men. But let's say if a family member believes that somebody has the potential to harm somebody in the workplace, they're showing displays of anger, they've bought a gun, or they're just acting irrational. What should that person do? Should they notify the company? That's another phenomenal question, uh, Dawn. And I know we haven't collaborated on these questions because you always ask me just to speak off the cuff. Yeah. So here's the other problem with that. Yes, if I see a gun or if I hear discussions about a gun or if I hear ideation about violence, I'm going to tell someone. But here's my fear behind telling someone, whether it's for attribution, Felix Nader, or whether it's anonymously calling in. And I fear that somehow or another, Felix is going to know I was the one who dropped the dime on him. Mm -hmm. And if that whole interaction is mishandled and Felix doesn't get treated properly, I am gonna feel bad because I anonymously or for attribution believe you are gonna help, management was gonna help. If during that process things go wrong and he doesn't get the help, it's all my fault. But here's how the tables turn. Because if Felix gets angry and he knows or suspects that I was, you know, that he knows who was that dropped the dime on him. He's now going for that individual. And to further complicate the problem, management is probably not equipped to protect that individual from the angst that he's going to get from Felix. So you have three concerns here. Will management do the right thing? Will they protect me? And who is going to be responsible for my safety and my security? away from the workplace. So it's a lot to think about when you're imposing management's will on the workforce to do the right thing. When I say it's a collaboration that starts from the top down, meet to the middle, where mm -hmm. trust and confidence is the, built around you doing something that is measurable and visible. Yes. Now, I know that you had an interview with Wolf Blitzer on CNN not too long ago. What yes. was your interview about? That particular one dealt with the, the mail bombing situations, the terrorists that were using um, the mails to mail bombs. Uh, mm -hmm. And, I, and that, piece, that piece of it more was more or less to educate them on how well prepared the Postal Service is to identify those kinds of threats and how well trained the, the workforce is to, to know how to handle those things so that the, they, don't go off the, they don't go off unintentionally or by accident. So I wanted to enlighten them. They were initially um, looking for a hook. And um, I, I educated and, and, and brought their insight to a higher level of understanding that caused the interview to go in the direction that you all saw, a more positive one, a more reassuring one. Because the last thing in the world we wanted to do with that interview was convey negativity that would cause the public to be concerned about going to their mailboxes. That's not what the Postal Service really wanted. They wanted to reassure the public that we have everything under control. And they do, by the way. And they do most of the time, they inter intercept the, the mail bombs, letter bombs within the post office before they even get to the intended target. Right. And Felix, I know you have a lot of years of experience. You retired from the military. You worked in the postal. You've been a consultant for many years. Many years. What sets you apart from other workplace violence consultants? Very interesting. I, I didn't retire to come into this field on. Um, I retired to take care of my wife's honey-do list. It wasn't until <laughs> September 11th of 2001 when folks on Long Island decided that they needed a quote unquote, an expert to take a look at workplace security issues related to counterterrorism and workplace security. So what sets me apart? If you were ever interview anyone like me, no one can say they have thousands of hours of testifying in civil and criminal matters. 
No one would say they have thousands of hours assessing and evaluating these incidents from the grassroots level, right through senior management of, a, of an organization. No one can say they testify at Merit Systems Protection Board, at EEO hearings, at arbitration hearings, at criminal hearings, at civil proceedings. No one can say that I have the 10,000 hours that we often hear about are necessary to build that level of confidence and professional reassurance that you know what you're talking about. I come to this from the standpoint of protecting the employer from civil liability and the workforce from physical liability. So I come at it with a two-pronged perspective. It's a wholesome approach based upon a holistic approach. So my, dif my differentiators are quite, quite obvious. I come with bona fide skill sets from the United States Postal Service as a postal inspector who worked on a violence interdiction team on Long Island, New York, that never had an incident involving two individuals that resulted in death. There were two suicides and they were because of conditions that were beyond the individual's ability to manage. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of our direct uh, proactivity, there were no major events other than the minor things that eventually towards my, 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 my retirement date all seemed to stabilize. Yeah, and you know, I'm really glad you gave a comprehensive answer on that, Felix. And the reason why is today, I see a lot of um, mostly men, but they're also women that they were a prior police officer or they got out of the military and now they call themselves experts in workplace violence prevention. So I'm really glad that you explained the difference. All right, so if an employer says, man, I like what Felix is saying, I would like to hire him, but they say, I don't have enough money. What do you say to that, Felix? I wanna be sarcastic in a pleasant way. I would say Go if you're ahead. serious and committed to the investment of the safety and security of your workforce, whatever number I give you, there are 12 months in a year. You can spread your payments out over 12 months. You could ask me for a preferred client discount of which, which I do offer. You could look at doing it in incremental stages. You can do phase one today, phase two, six months from now, phase three next year. I work with large organizations and they're very smart who, who phase the program in. They phase me in to do one piece this year, the next piece th the following year, and eventually these large organizations that, that hire me get what they want out of me in a collaborative fashion. I am not the expert, Dawn. You know, even though my son suggested I use it in my, in my descriptions and my clients refer to me as an expert, I look upon what I do as a sharing of perspectives. And the experts are really all the, the, the professionals, the psychologists, the social service, the, the behavioral people, the mental, the mental health people. I just fill in the gaps on where I see the vulnerabilities that need to be shored, that need to be tied together from a management perspective and a workforce perspective so that they two meet at the center. I understand this. When a judge on, on, a, on a civil case said to me, don't testify about your best practices, Inspector Nader, in my retirement. Testify about what you did. I felt totally relieved because when it comes to the human dimension, there are no best practices. There are just things that have to be done correctly through trial and error. Yes. And, you know, Felix, I have this saying I've used for years. We are always on parade and we never know who's watching. So I know you've done tons of talks. You've you know, written articles, you've done webinars. What is the best way for people to learn even more about you and to follow you or even to reach out to you? My excitement always gets the best of me. I fail to answer that question. So go to my website, www.naderassociates.com. Follow me at Twitter, at twitter.com. Uh, 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 enjoy the interaction. Follow me on LinkedIn as well, and you'll find some really deep perspectives but you'll get to know a lot about me by just going on my website and deciding for yourself whether or not I'm the right guy. I share a lot and it's up to you to decide whether or not I am or not, but you're gonna get the real deal when you hire Nader Associates. Now, I know before this interview, we had a little personal chat. What are some of the next projects and adventures that you're gonna be doing that can definitely help people? Thank you, Dawn. So two things, uh, one personal, one business. Uh, last year, I spent a lot of time um, looking, on, looking on me and what I needed to do better for my business. And we put together an e-learning system that is now ready to be showcased and that alleviates the, 
the interest in having me all over the world by having my content all over the world. And we're gonna be marketing that very, very soon. Collaborating with other organizations who also wanna collaborate with me in terms of sharing their perspective to uh, integrate and collaborate with, with them. Uh, on a personal note, I, I joined an organization that had me here in Charlotte called Answer Scholarship. And it's a woman's program for moms that wanna go back to school that have children. And uh, I have uh, become a proud board member of that organization. And on Saturday, we're doing a pancake sponsorship to raise funds. We're doing so well. I should say the, the ladies are doing so well. 12 uh, students last year, 12 graduates. And we wow. were projecting you know, double that number for 2021. They're very earnest, they're very sincere. And it's such a pleasure working with this group uh, in a variety of different formats. That's what I'm up to. I don't get enough of life. I live every day for the moment. Tomorrow is not promised. So I invest all my energy, my time, my resources in the moment. Yes, 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 yes. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you again, you. Um, having this discussion. We're down to the last few minutes. Are there any burning words of wisdom or just anything you want to get out and say to the listeners? Dawn, you do a tremendous job in giving me this platform. I believe in an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And however it falls on someone's head, let it fall through the desires of your wisdom to convey as much knowledge uh, to the hearts and minds of all of us. I say, keep on doing what you're doing and thank you for the opportunity to, to share my thoughts and perspectives. Yes, and if anybody just tuned in at the last minute, do you mind giving your contact information, website, whatever information, would you do that one more time, please? Absolutely, it's uh, naderassociates.com, www.nader, with a T, N-A-T-E-R, associates.com, and a toll-free number of 877-825-8101 that follows me wherever I may be, either on the, in the office or through my cell phone. Yeah. Felix, I wish you the very best on your projects. Okay. So anybody listening in, I've known Felix for years. He is not only a wealth of information, there's a lot of smart people out there, but he is one of the most positive people I know on this earth. I Every do. day, he really does walk his talk. So some good news for me, I will have my first workbook out called "Work Standing Up to Workplace Bullying and Discrimination. It'll probably be out in the next 30 days. I've written and created it over the past two years because I realized that there was nothing out there for people to use when they are having problems in the workplace. And yes, this is you know toward employees. And I also work with employers to have safe and respectful work environments because when we don't have safe environments, people do not feel psychologically safe. Absolutely. Any comments on that, Felix? No, I, I agree. I, I think the two uh, intangibles that employees do not focus and miss, trust and confidence. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you want me to do, support me in what I do, and then support me when I make a mistake. Don't come after me uh, to, to discipline me. Trust and confidence, and I'll give you a thousand percent. Treat me like an adult, not like a child that I would treat at home. Yes. I don't know where we've gone wrong in the um, work environment, why employees don't necessarily trust employers and employers don't trust employees, but that's where we're at now. That doesn't mean that's where we have to stay forever. Absolutely. We can always you know, have safe and respectful work environments by having policies, you know, talking to people like Felix so that there's safe work environments, being proactive instead of being reactive, because right. if we're reactive, it's usually that we're in trouble. People don't trust the management and then that affects production overall. And again, people don't feel safe and they always deserve to feel safe. Again, thanks, Felix. I'm Don Westmoreland. Till next week, stay empowered. And thank you. Thank you for thank listening you. in. You bet, Don. Thank you.